Hey, how's it going guys? Today I wanted to do a quick video on one of my new hobbies, that being emulator handhelds. This is the Anbernic RG35XX 2024 or new. Um, and so this is my first introduction into these kinds of devices. I am pretty familiar with emulation though. I have been using emulators for quite some time, all the way back to like when I was maybe like five or six years old for economic reasons, I'll say, simply put. But uh, yeah, so this is my first emulator handheld and I just wanted to talk about my experience with this device. So performance wise, this can play up to PlayStation 1 comfortably. Dreamcast and 64 PSP tend to be a bit of a mixed bag. And as far as I'm aware, any popular firmware for this device or similar devices isn't going to support anything after that. So we're talking like PS2, GameCube. Those aren't going to be supported as far as I'm aware. And I don't blame the creators not for supporting them because I don't think they would run very great on this. So let's get into my personal experience. So I was originally using the stock SD card, which is this generic 64 gigabyte SD card. It comes stock with a bunch of games on it and the stock firmware. I personally don't like the stock firmware mainly because I think it's ex like extremely redundant to have game rooms and RetroArch games as two separate sections. I understand they do function slightly different, but ultimately they achieve the same thing. And so most reviewers I've seen say not to use this SD card. Some people say they have gotten nicer SD cards with theirs, but if it's generic, I would stay away from it. And here's why. I was using this SD card for a while because I thought it would be fine, right? Maybe people were over-exaggerating or anything like that. And I did flash MuOS on here. That is my OS of choice after looking around. As that's going here, as it's on the boot screen, this is the SD card I've switched to. This is a Samsung SD card. It's the same type that I have in my Switch. So, right, it's been reliable there. I figured why not go with something that I found reliable in this device. So that's why I went with this. And honestly, have zero complaints. It's snappy enough, no real issues. And one thing I will note about SD cards is if you are going to buy a separate one or two separate ones, if you run a two card system, I would strongly recommend getting ones that are 64 gigs or above because anything lower than that, I've looked at 32 gig SD cards as well because I don't plan on dumping a bunch of games on this. But with anything lower than 64 gigs, I have found most of them, if not all of them, were at a like older or slower SD card standard. So those SD cards will not perform as well as far as I'm concerned. And so going with something that's 64 gigs or above isn't that much more expensive and will get you those faster speeds. That's why I went with 128 gigs. Also gives me a little bit of buffer room if I do choose to dump a bunch of games on this, but I don't see that happening. You can see here that MuOS is still booting up and all I was doing when this was happening was going into the advanced options. The advanced options aren't crazy or anything. They're simple things like swapping these buttons, things like that. The OS suddenly froze. I hit the reset button on the side and here we are. So that's why switching over to a reputable brand's SD card might be a good idea, right? I don't think something like this would happen to everyone, but I think it's a reasonable precaution to take. It's not that expensive either, right? Maybe like 20 bucks, 15 bucks. Okay, so booting up into my actual SD card, this is also running MuOS, and we can see it boots up pretty quickly. That's why I like MuOS. It's very quick, snappy, simple. I do have a theme on here, and so, right, very simple layout, similar to things like Garlic OS and whatnot. So, right, shouldn't be any big surprises here. In terms of my personal game library, I do have Game Boy Advance, N64, SNES, Dreamcast, Sega CD, Neo Geo, PlayStation, PSP. Now, one thing I will mention about this library is that Neo Geo is a bit of a pain to get working as with most arcade systems. And I, I mainly play Metal Slug, 
So right mouse slug like three, four, five. These are games that I grew up with and I really, really love. But when there are a lot of things on the screen, the game will slow down. It'll still be very playable, but the frame rates will slow down. It's still a smooth experience, but right, you do definitely get those slowdowns. And I mean, it's not a big deal with Neo Geo because the original system would do that too. But it is something to note, right? If you want that kind of flawless experience. Dreamcast, some games do work well. Soul Calibur, for instance, works perfectly fine. But Sonic Adventure 2, eh, eh. I get that it's a faster game and it's probably a little bit more difficult for the system to keep up with. And you definitely feel it with this. I feel like frame skip kicks in pretty often with this. And also, not to mention playing with a D-pad is a bit iffy with a game like this. N64, right? I haven't played too much Conquers on here, but Kirby 64, during some sections of levels, I do get slowdowns. It's still very playable, but it does have slowdowns. So it, it, again, a bit of a mixed bag here. I personally do really like Kirby 64 on this device though, because Kirby 64 mainly uses the D-pad. It doesn't really use the analog stick. Aside from that, I do want to talk about PSP. So most of these games run reasonably well, but the main reason why I got this device rather than the like Miu Mini Plus were for these games. Project Diva, well, not really Project Diva, but Project Diva 2nd and Extend. I personally don't like the first one because the D-pad doesn't do anything. But 2nd and Extend run great on this. I can actually run it at two times upscaled with the 60 FPS cheat on. So that has been an amazing experience. It runs amazingly. There are some dips here and there for instance, during a section in Rolling Girl, there's a section where the scene and the music video changes quite drastically towards the end. And there was a bit of a slowdown there, but there isn't much happening in the song, like, buttons-wise. So it's not a big deal, and apart from that, I haven't really noticed any significant slowdowns. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about why I like Moo West. So one big reason is that these folders don't need to be named anything specific, as far as I'm aware. The only catch is that when you start up a game for the first time within a like new folder, you will have to select what core to run it with. Or something like SNK Neo Geo, I'd open the folder, and if this was my first time running a game within this folder, when I press A, it will bring me to the core select screen. I can get back to that by pressing select. And for Neo Geo, right, just got to scroll down, SNK Neo Geo. I personally use Final Burn Neo. And now every game within this folder is associated with that Final Burn Neo core. So, right, you don't have to set it for every game. You just have to set it for one game within a folder. Not that difficult, only takes a couple seconds, right? And, right, you don't have to do it for every game. So that I personally really like. Another thing that I do like are the options to clean up these game titles, right? So a lot of ROM names will have the region attached to the name of the ROM, as well as sometimes a version number or like demo or whatever else. But you do have an option to clean that up within MooOS. So if I go back to config, general, interface options, and the content name scheme and content dash replacement, right? They are set up to clean things up a little bit. Let's say I remove those two settings, go back to the SNES folder. Right now we have the regions attached to it. Okay, so let's talk about other features of MooOS. All of these are very similar to other firmware. Let's talk about shutting off the device, right? If you need to shut it off really quick, right? Something comes up, maybe you're waiting in line and you're called up, right? So you can just hold this button for a couple of seconds. The device will vibrate. And if you saw down there, it created a safe state. However, this device is actually currently in kind of a sleep mode. 
So it is still technically on. You can see the power LED is still on and that'll stay on for however long you have like your shutdown timer for. So for me, that's 60 seconds. If I turn the device back on with the, in that 60 seconds, it'll just pick up from where I left off and I'm just back to playing again. You can set the timer to be much longer, right? But you'll probably expect battery drain during that. But because you did create a safe state by holding down this button, you can just load it back up, right? So it's not too much of a big deal. It doesn't have a proper sleep mode as far as I'm aware, but functionally this is fine for MiUOS because even if your device does shut off, booting the game back up from like completely off shouldn't take that long because booting up into MiUOS takes maybe about 10 seconds with a decent SD card. So quickly going over competitors, there's the Anbernic RG28XX, 35XX+, H, SP, and now the 40XX, as well as the Miu Mini Plus. I do think each device has its own place. I think this device is particularly great for traveling because it is still quite small and it is great for things like turn-based games, especially because if you're on a plane, right, you're shaking around a lot, you can go a little slower on those games and this device is well suited for those old JRPGs. You will be missing out on Wi-Fi. However, for someone who is traveling a lot, I don't think they'd be someone who is taking advantage of Wi-Fi super often. Bluetooth is also going to be missing. And on stock firmware, that's mainly for external controllers. So if you're mainly playing on the device, I don't think that's a big deal. But on certain custom firmwares, you can use it for audio. But good old headphone jack works just as well. I do want to be very clear in saying that this device isn't necessarily going to be for everyone. It really depends on who you are, what kind of games you want to play, because if you really want to play N64 games, you may end up leaning more towards the 35XXH or the 40XXH, because those do have analog sticks, albeit I've heard those analog sticks can be a little iffy, but they're there. They're probably going to be better than a D-pad for certain games. That's going to be it for this video. This device has been a great introduction for me into the, I guess, retro or emulator handheld space. I've been playing a lot of Pokemon Emerald, Earthbound, and some Fire Emblem, and I've been having a great time with all of those. I think the $100 space for these kinds of devices is a great place to start because these devices have actually gotten quite powerful, and you'll probably get a good nostalgia blast out of these, especially if you grew up in like the 90s or early 2000s. With all that said and done, if you have any questions about this device, just let me know in the comments down below and I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. If you do have questions about any of the other devices I've mentioned, I'm probably not the best person to ask because I don't personally have those on hand. I would love to, but I really want to try a device that's a bit more powerful than this so I can revisit some of those old GameCube and PS2 games. But yeah, anyways, thanks for watching and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Bye.